Hi, everybody. I am uh, a very grateful member of Alcoholics Anonymous. My name is Marty Jeffrey. Okay. okay, in closing, I got that. I was just thinking about those cakes in my early sobriety. I've been sober since uh, February the 8th of 1976. I know, a real old tortoise, but I sobered up at like 23. So I was thinking about that blonde and that cake and me in my first 30 days. <laughs> Wondering what she's going to look like, the one that hands out the chips. You know what I'm saying? It's just, I would have been obsessing. But it's, a, it's delightful. You're, you know, your group always, uh, your reputation precedes you. Specific group's a great group. And there's lots of great sobriety. over at Richie's house tonight, and they have a, uh, some sort of a sacrifice, and then later you eat. And it's, uh, you know, the only thing that, that was missing, of course, was Bob D. There was no podium, so he didn't show up to say grace. And uh, I know. Uh, I've known Bob a long time. I think the first, in fact, he asked me to come here, so I want to thank him for that. And, and uh, I, you know, always, uh, you know, our, I live in the United States of America right now. I'm working in a company that's doing children's cartoons, which I think is fitting in your 30th year of sobriety. And uh, what we're also trying to do is make the Internet a safe place for kids because it's, it's, I mean, it's just scarier and scarier. I think 30 years ago when I sobered up, the only other person in Alcoholics Anonymous under the age of like 35 or 40 was an 18-year-old kid. I mean, 20-year-olds were virtually unheard of. So to see so many, you know, beautiful young lives redeemed, and I can tell you from experience, so you got a head start when you don't, when you, when you sober up young. And I don't know if you've had the experience of one of the old farts coming up and saying, "How much could you have possibly drank? Have you had that happen yet?" You just want to puke on them and share some of it. Well, you know, I used to look at the old people and think, "How the hell did they stay out there that long?" You know. My liver's screwed, you know, I've, I've, my marriage is on the rocks. I've been married 15 minutes, and it's a mess. And... <laughs> anyway, I want to assure the new people in the room tonight, and, and it was so great to see you stand up. I think that's an act of bravery in itself. I'm not going to do any of the typical sort of talks that you've heard, you know, lectures, statistics, Alcoholics Anonymous and statistics. What a joke. How many people are in the groups now? We don't know. It's anonymous, you know. <laughs> Statistics are nuts anyway. I heard one the other day. 58% of people pray after sex. The, the other 42% use contraception. So. But the thing I wonder with all the statistics is like, where, how do you know that? What, do you have a survey group or something you go in right after? Are you praying now? <laughs> it's nuts. We're not going to do anything medical. We're not going to get, you know, uh, into the, uh, well, unless you want me to. I, I know that I, when I first sobered up, I, I was an alcoholic when I got here. I want you to know that I, I, de I developed alcoholism from coming to meetings. I was, uh, I had serious social problems a lot of misunderstandings with the people around me, a, a woman that just did not understand. And uh, I drank to relieve my stress, but I was not an alcoholic. And so the day that I realized that, that I actually, once I started to drink, I couldn't stop drink, drinking, I became absolutely terrified. Have any of you experienced this? Like all of a sudden you realize, oh my God, I'm an alcoholic? <laughs> alcohol. You know what I'm saying? Did you go through this? And I phoned my sponsor. I said, Dwayne. I was on the freeway. I'll never forget. I'm an alcoholic. And there was a dead pause. And he said, criminy. He said, you know, now it's unanimous. Everybody in Canada believes you're an alcoholic now that you've accepted it. But I said, well, what is it exactly? What is it do I have? And he sent me to this counselor guy. And in, in 1976... There wasn't a lot of that going on. There was mainly alcoholics, one alcoholic helping another alcoholic. And, and we took people home. And after they left, you still had your furniture. 
and all kinds of really weird stuff went on back in 1976. It was a kind of gentler place, I think. Anyway, I went to this guy, and his name was Bob Cruikshank. He's a very severe-looking man. And I said, I need to know exactly what it is that I have. He said, you're, you're a drunk. I said, no, but I mean, what do I have? He said, you have. And you new, newcomers, all we're going to ask is that you just remember this one small part. Take this out with you. You have a biochemical genetic disorder <laughs> centered in the hypothalamic information control center of your brain, which is made worse by your liver's inability to metabolize alcohol without producing acid aldehyde, which mixed with dopamine produces tetrahydroisoquinoline. And that is a deadly combination given your narcissistic, egocentric core, which is driven at times by feelings of omnipotence, which tend to their own integrity despite the cognitive dissonance. I, I know. I said, what does that mean? He said, your drinker is broke. Doesn't it, that all doesn't matter. That is all true. But the fact of the matter is, if you take a drink and then the drink takes another drink, you've got the same thing I've got. That's all there is to it. That is all there is to it. That's what makes us different from that class of people that we used to drink with that went home. Do you remember those people? <laughs> the ones with superior will or better home situations or something? Do you remember those guys? Like, well, I'm going to go now. And you go, What? Because inside of you, it's going... But you're thinking, well, they haven't finished their drink. They may leave it. <laughs> Our program has a, a suggestion for people like me that we, we follow a little format, lest we digress. And that format is that we tell you what I was like, what happened, and now, what am I like now? And I want to really make it very, very specific <laughs> that it is not what it was like, what happened, and what it is like now, because what it was like was the result of how I was. I've come to understand that if I leave the house with a good attitude, the number of horses arses in the world drop by over 95%. I've come to understand that if I have an attitude of gratitude, that the intelligence on the planet Earth goes up many, many times. And people drive better when I'm grateful. It's true. And so, as the big book says so correctly, that our troubles are largely of our own making. And that what's wrong with me centers in my mind. And so, my little alcohol story starts at age 11, and I know, I know, in fact, I, I snuck into a specific group meeting. I got to talk at the, at the Tri-State a while back, but I snuck into this group because I knew I was coming. I thought, what would that be like? And there was a woman who had started drinking at age three, and I thought, yeah, it's getting tougher and tougher to be weird. But, <laughs> and then last week I had yet another experience. I want you to think about this, and I don't want any of you young women to get nauseated, but I had a, a new baby, me, fathered a new baby, born two weeks ago. I know. What can happen, huh? <laughs> Girl over there went, ew. But uh, <laughs> yes, it's true. We're still having sex. Get over it. Anyway. And loving it. And slower. But um, <laughs> I forgot to pray is basically what happened. So here's my new son, and oh, he's adorable, and he's healthy, and mama's healthy, and she's 36 years old, never been a mother before, she's gorgeous, and, and uh, they have a breast. You know what this is? This is not good news if you've got one of these appendages God hangs on the male of the species, because they cut the tip off of the thing. It's like get one of those cigar things, and like so. It hurts. And so... They, they created what are called sugar balls. This is they dip, they take Manischewitz wine and sugar. And they usually give a kid one. Mine had four. And I'm looking at him after the thing, he's 
bring it on. You know, like, wah, or wah, 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 wah. Sounded like a newcomer at about the 30th day. Wah, wah. He's just all right, you know. So he's already had a slip. And uh, I, I have two other children. I have a 31-year-old son, his older brother. <laughs> you know you're old when your baby's born and he has a nephew and a niece, which he does. I have a 29-year-old son and I have a 27-year-old daughter and she has two children. So it's, it, I don't care what you think when you get here. What's going to happen to you is beyond your wildest imaginings. Boy, I would have never bet that at age 54 I would be learning again how to change diapers. And baby poop smells just the same Except at this age and after this amount of sobriety, I know he's not just doing that to bug me. That is just a natural <laughs> function. So there's been some growth, you know. It's exciting to be on the planet. But anyway, here, here's, here's how it goes. Here's what I was like. I was, I was a kind of an okay kid, I think. I, you know, my mother used to tell me I was very bright. And I didn't hear that at school or anywhere else, but <laughs> my... I had problems at school. They wanted to contain you. And I didn't understand containment at all. I, uh, they used to give me the strap, and my mission in life was to learn how to do that and smile at the same time. It was like, you know, hit me as hard as you can. It makes me feel like a man. And um, that's how you know you're a drunk when they're disciplining and you're figuring out how you can do it gracefully because it's, you know it's not going to stop. And... At about age 11, I was over at a friend's place, and we were in the bathroom, and there was a bottle of Loganberry wine. And we, uh, we cracked that baby. And he took a sip, and he spit it in the toilet. And I took a sip, and my entire world changed. I knew I never wanted to ever see him again. <laughs> Everybody would s spit that stuff in the toilet. You know, I immediately developed a new vocabulary. Moron. What are you, what are you doing? And I polished off the better part of that bottle and I had a spiritual experience. I was taken to the fourth dimension, dementia of living. And, uh, I got on my little bicycle. I remember thinking things immediately. I had, I had, it, instead of the, the, the torrent of thoughts that I normally had in my mind, you know, that like in and out, there was just one thought. That's what alcohol used to do for me. It laser focus me into a resentment. <laughs> which was on my brother Michael right at this point in time. <laughs> I hated Michael. Michael was four years older than I was. I was Here's how you, you can just know that God is just. Because when I was 20 years sober, my brother Michael asked me to sponsor him in AA. I said, oh, yeah, I'd love to. <clears throat> he's, he's still sober, but he's a weaker, gentler person than he was. I went home. I was going to beat Michael up. I, I, I suddenly, I don't know why, but I looked in the mirror and I saw that I was a lot more man than I had ever noticed. And my nose was remarkably reduced. It's another... And I got on my bicycle and I, I wound that baby up. I figured I could probably do light speed by the end of the block, but I impacted a truck. It was parked. <laughs> and the two thoughts that went through my mind, you know, it's amazing how you remember some of this stuff. I don't remember eating my first taco, but my first drunk is crystal clear. I think it was important to me. I hit this thing and I immediately think, that didn't hurt. As I'm flying through the air giving a skin donation. And... uh <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, man, this is fun, you know? And I got home, and my mother met me at the door, and this is how I know for certain that there is only one alcoholic brain and that we all get to use it because we all give the same answer. When I opened the door, my mother opened the door, and I was there, and I was bloodied, and I had a little bit of Loganberry wine on me. She said, were you drinking? And I said, I had two. Nobody told me to say that. It's just out of the alcoholic brain. Just two. And when I was like 20 years old and the car was upside down and the cop said, were you drinking? I said, just two. That's it. 
I, uh, I, I, I remember uh, throwing up, and I remember not liking that so much, but thinking, you know, if I have to do that in order to get this. Loganberry wine, of course, goes down purple, comes up pink, floats on water. It's amazing. And uh, I went after my brother Michael. That was about a three-minute fight. He hit me. I hit him. I hit him. I hit him. He hit me. I went down. It was morning. And uh, remember my father kicking my arse. It was it was uh, not physically not a good night for me. But in the mo- in the morning, I couldn't wait to school to get to school to tell the other kids what I found. And I described. Yeah, I puked. I smack my bike up, I, you know, Mike beat me up. They're saying, you like this? You know, <laughs> yeah. And I started a behavior, and this is the, you know, although you never hear this at an al meeting, you will hear at AA the cunning mind of the alcoholic. And uh, I used to just get inspirations between drinking periods. And at age 11, it suddenly dawned on me, that almost every Friday and Saturday night in the little town in which I lived, at the local Army and Navy Hall, there were Ukrainian weddings. How would they know if I was family or not? And I, I had a little suit, and I'd put my little suit on, and I'd go to the wedding. <laughs> they'd greet you at the door, and they'd say, are you with the bride or the groom? And I'd say, both. I don't, no preference. I just, they, they thought that was amazing. And I'd get drinking the home brew, and I'd lay on the floor and watch the band spin, and it was, life was good. And I stole, and I did stuff. And I mean, I just, it's an amazing thing that even at age 11, what I was manifesting was the inability to face life on life's terms. It was just overwhelming to me. I can't explain that to anybody, and I can't explain to earth people the fact that alcoholism moves at different rates in different parts in different people. That for me, from the first drink, I craved. From the first time alcohol entered my body, the drink took a drink. My brother Michael didn't get that until he was well into his 30s. And then all of a sudden the phenomenon of craving started and his life went down the toilet. But emotionally I wasn't there. Spiritually I wasn't there. And so I went undetected until I was in my probably late teens when people started to say, do you think you have a problem drinking? And I'm thinking, are you nuts? Nobody can drink more than I can drink. Problem? I love drinking. It's life I can't stand. It's the periods between the drinking. That's what I'm having trouble with. Another example of my alcoholism is Christmas, coming home from university. This is a joyous time in a family. I, I mean, I was home, and we got into the booze, and my brother Paul and I got into a fight over a road race set. And uh, the last thing I remember was my father, who was a huge, physically powerful man, throwing me down the stairs. And it was a long flight of stairs. And I remember my mother standing at the top saying, one day you will kill him. And he said, if he is lucky. My dad was not an alcoholic. My dad was that class of drinker that when people drank too much, he drank too much. When they didn't drink, he didn't drink. And if they drank socially, he drank socially. It was a mystery to me. I couldn't understand that ever. I thought, man, this guy's got willpower. He didn't care. I remember that night, that Christmas night, sleeping literally under a table. I remember my coming to and my father on his knee. I guess he'd searched for me all night and he found me in this rag bag apartment and uh, begged me to come home and, and spend Christmas with the family. And I remember the pain, and I, I remember all of that, and I remember getting drunk that night because the, the, the humiliation of it was just beyond. By the time I was in my last year before I stopped drinking, so I'd be 20, 22, I was a radio broadcaster, and uh, we'd, had, we'd had a party. And uh, my wife had left. I didn't understand, by the way, that she was leaving. I, I didn't, I, I don't know. There's a disconnect that takes place. She said, I'm going home to mother and father. I thought she was going to visit. I, it never occurred to me that she should have said, and I'm not coming back. I might have got that, but I mean, it didn't. So days went by, and they never came home. But it was kind of good because I could drink. 
See what I'm saying? And I'm young and I'm dumb and I've got a six-month-old baby and I'm at this radio staff party and I steal... This is so humiliating. Steal beer out of the staff party. And, and you know, I don't know about you, but when I drank, I turned virtually invisible. And so they might have seen the box of beer going out the building, but I was pretty sure they wouldn't have seen who the hell was taking it. And I get out in the car and I thought, slick, undetected. And I went home to drink my prize and I fell up the stairs. I don't know how the hell you do that, but I went up, the beer went down, and a lot of the beer broke. It was hard. it was the saddest thing. Family was gone. Eh, beer. Oh. Oh. You know, these, these big spicy sausages, I thought, you know, I've had a bad night. I've, I've, uh, I'm going to have a sausage. I'll feel better. <laughs> Took a big suck of beer, put the sausage in the oven, and passed out. Of course it caught fire. When I woke up, there was thick, greasy smoke and me on the floor. And I'm thinking, roll and crawl, roll and crawl. You could do or you could save the entire apartment block, you know. And I knock on my neighbor, and, I t- and I'm drunk, no clothes on. <laughs> God, that even grosses me out. I'm, you know. And I knock... And I say, fire. <laughs> and this guy, did you have that at the end of your drinking when they're, they're, the disgust in their face was just like, it would shrink your soul. And this guy just pushed me aside. He said, you are a drunken, disgusting, your, your oven's on fire, you idiot. What have you got? There's like a dog turd in there all black. And, I immediately figured that's why Shirley's gone, because the apartment stinks of garlic and, and burnt meat. So I phoned her. I said, we'll move. If that's upsetting you, I'll get a house. There is no understanding in the relationship between an alcoholic and their hostage. I'm sorry, wife. And um, so she came back. I had six more months of the most insane drinking save about a one-month period where I had a full remission. 100%. You know, this is how I know that I have a disease. This is not self-inflicted. This is not I drank too much beer and broke my drinker. This has nothing to do with any of that. Remission is when one day you wake up, you drink a beer, you drink scotch, that's all you want. Wow. I'd never had that before, and I thought, wow. Booze is like acne. It clears up, you know? You just got to live long enough, and then you start to drink normally. The obsession of every abnormal drinker is not to drink, not to get drunk. It's to control the amount they drink. That is the trick. If you're new in here at 30 days, don't kid yourself. It's not about drinking or not drinking. Somewhere deep inside yourself, your big hope is, is that somehow you, someday, that you're going to control your drinking. Every single addiction works like that. The first lie an addiction tells you is, you don't have me. That's one good thing. At least you're not alcoholic. And second, if you were, you could control it. Mm. So I had a month of going over to the bar, and we'd have our drinks, and then I, like the super people, would go home. (laughs) And then one day... It happened. It was like unbelievable. There was a car, there was a gun, there was one of the fellow workers. I know her brassiere was off. I know her boyfriend had a gun. I don't know if I was involved. I have no idea. That's the really shitty part about God. He only wakes you up for the embarrassing piece. You know, like, how do I know? Maybe there was really some hot stuff going on, but I missed it. I just, I always missed it. I'd I'd wake up just in time to go, you know? I swore, I got home that night, I passed out, it was February, it was brutally cold in Canada in February, in that part of the world. And I swore in the morning, God, this is the, the uh, alcoholic national anthem, if you could see your way somehow clear to getting me out of this, 
there is so much I could do for you in the third world uh, in way of, you know, gratis broadcasting or whatever you need there. And um, I went to work and it started to heal. Alcoholics have this thing, this magic web around them for a period of time. It's like a big pink blanket. No matter how bad you screw up, you flip the car nine times, everybody gets out. <laughs> and then, you know, and then all of a sudden you hit a pole and two people are dead. And then, and then somebody suicides. And in the, you start to, it's like, in the book it's called a rapacious creditor. Rapacious creditor. It starts to take back not just what you took, but everything. Back. And so... That day I went to work and there was I was sick and I was nervous and and uh, and I I knew I'm, I'll never drink again. And then at five o'clock in the afternoon, after the president of the company had called me in and told me I was still going to be working there, and the girls had decided not to press charges, and uh, oh God, and uh, you know on and on and on, I'm thinking what a day I've had. God, did I say I'd never drink again? Or did I say, I'll never drink again to excess? <laughs> Pretty sure I would never say I would never drink again because one of the miracles that Jesus Christ performed in Capernaum was that he turned water into wine. It was his very first miracle, which must mean that Jesus Christ, Savior of the world, wants me to drink. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And yet, I had trouble with the whole concept of delusion. What a program where the second word is admitted. You ever think about that? You have to be completely deluded before you have to admit something. It didn't say, we're alcoholic our lives. We had to admit. <laughs> because no matter what you accuse me, I wasn't there. And I was six months sober. A guy says, hey, I saw you in Safeway last week. I said, no, you didn't. I was there. I just didn't want him to know I was there. And I didn't know why I didn't want him to know I was there. I just didn't want him to know I was in Safeway. What could somebody do with a piece of information like that? I was... <laughs> Five o'clock, I go across to the bar, and it sets in motion the most out of control. I remember I put my friend Jim's head through drywall about the seventh time, and I thought he was going to, his eyes were rolling back, and then I ended the night by throwing him through a bank window. And the one good thing about me when I drank was that I was not violent. <laughs> unless provoked. Like, say, for example, somebody was breathing. That would piss me off. Or you looked happy, you know? <laughs> Or you had a nice car. That could cause violence, but it was not anything I set in motion. <laughs> there is something that goes on inside your head when you're drunk that you start to get very resentful at strangers. And anyway, I, it, was a, it was a horrible, horrible night. And in the morning, I woke up with the, the, the horseman Bill talks about, you know, guilt and remorse and and. And I don't know about your drinking, but with my drinking, when I woke up in the morning, I would get bits and pieces of things. You know, if you're here tonight and you're, you're new and you're blacking out, I want to welcome you to the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous because normal people don't black out. Normal people drink, burp, fart, go home. <laughs> Boring. We drink and then we go into the death syndrome. The brain starts to collapse because alcohol is not as turgid as water and our brain thinks we're dying. And you know what? We like that a lot. <laughs> Whoa! Dr. Silkworth said we drink for that elusive feeling. Only generated when that alcohol hits. You know? Mmm. Oh, God, that's good. And that's that feeling that I drank for. I always just, and you try to recapture that, you know? And the more alcoholic you become, the harder and more elusive that is. Is that at the ninth drink, the second drink, the third drink? Maybe if I drank wine first, then water, and you try and manage the disorder, but it always ends up the same way. You go over the ski jump, and then it's morning. And there's bits and pieces, bits and pieces. And I thought, oh, Jesus, the bank. Oh, my God, the car. I smashed the car up. Surely. Oh, oh, I hope nobody saw me. Oh, you know. And then the phone was ringing way off in the distance. And when I picked the phone up, it was one of those nosy, intervening 
self-centered, caring bastards they call family. (laughs) You know the ones I mean. They care. And it's not that you haven't tried to push them away hard enough or something. It was my sister. And she said, do you you think you have a drinking problem, Marty? You know when you're in enough trouble, you'll go to anything? If she'd have sent me to, you know, Dog Molesters Anonymous, I'd have gone just to... Whatever you guys think, you know what? Just if you would just let me get the just get this settled down and get my life back into some sort of order, and then I could start to like I want I just want to drink scotch. I don't want any trouble with anybody. I just want to drink scotch and have a woman and a white piano and and be Elton John. Other than that, you know. And um, she said, "Would you speak to a guy from Alcoholics Anonymous?" God is my witness, I thought. I haven't got enough trouble. I've got to help some guy from... (sighs) Will the burden of my gift never let up? The guy they sent over was a huge Norwegian. His name was Dwayne. That was not good. My father-in-law was a Norwegian. He used to swear at me in Norwegian when I picked my wife up. (laughs) <laughs> Literally translated means gee dick ad da fairy de bee de. They don't they don't have a language. Anyway, out of all of the people in Alcoholics Anonymous, God sends he sends a Norwegian. But this one is big. And this one is thirteen years sober. And this one is a counselor. Oh God. And he drove a nineteen seventy six Ford L T D, Robin Egg Blue. And when it came up to the front, it looked like the docking of the Queen Mary. I hated him. I hated his car. I hated his hair. I hated his teeth. I hated the windows in his car. I hated me. I hated, I just hated. And when he picked me up, I said, hi, good to meet you. (laughs) My father-in-law is Norwegian. (laughs) Know any words? You know, we went to the A&W on our first date. I'd never been at an A&W with another man before. It was like, what are we going to do here? I'm figuring the lecture's going to start. It's going to start. It always starts. And he starts talking about getting drunk and doing stupid stuff. See? It says in the big book, this is a classic story of carrying the message of alcoholics. It says in the big book, if the man seems a little nervous, tell him a few funny stories. And Dwayne told me stuff. And, you know, I'm an alcoholic. That, that basically is an ego that drinks and so every story he'd tell, I'd tell him one worse. And by the time, <laughs> well, 30 minutes into it, I've done half of my fifth step. <laughs> and he said to me, the thing that convicted me and allowed me to stay sober from the time I came to Alcoholics Anonymous till now. I have never, ever had, now I've had lots of emotional trouble. I've been a complete weenie and I've missed meetings and I've been a very bad boy but I have never had any merry wonderful or mind-altering chemicals or booze. It has not. I'm, I always think of that story when the guy said it has not been necessary. The guy said, I ha- it hasn't been necessary for me to take a drink for 12 years. And the guy said, you know, you were full of crap. I saw you last night. You were drunk. He said, I know, but was it necessary? <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't wanted to drink. It says on page 85 in our book, that it comes to us, it's like a gift, that we are placed in a position of neutrality. It isn't something I did or conjured up or understood or figured it out. or You know, all I was was one thing. Please hear me if you're new. Willing. You know how, I, you, know, how you know you're willing? Because you're going to a bunch of meetings. And you've got people like Richie whipping your ass and making, you know, move the chairs. Now move them back that way. Put them over here. Now, when do you Turn the chair upside down. Now sit on the upside down chair. <laughs> Guys, come on. Let's see what he's doing. You know, when you're doing that stuff, you're going to stay sober. And then when you're sober, you got another guy. Okay, get the chair. Now move it. Take it upside down. It's down. Now you spin because you can think of new stuff when you're sober, right? <laughs> That's what I had. I had willingness, and God took. It says in the books, they're amazing words. 
Because it's not about character transformation or behavior modification. It says that the problem was seemingly lifted out of us. That all of a sudden, things that were important to me became unimportant. And that I was set on a new path. And that I would start to see others. And that I would start to have less selfish thinking. You see, I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't understand the difference between me and all of the people around me. I'd drink, they'd drink. I'd get drunk. I thought they got drunk. Were you amazed when you got sober? You go to a wedding and everybody wasn't puking drunk? Did that amaze you? And some of them dance and their, their pants aren't wet or anything. <laughs> you can do that? You see, we're narcissistic. That's a person that's having a love affair with themselves and can't stand the object of their affection. I'm happy, I think you're happy. I'm drunk, I think you're drunk. I'm sad, you be sad. Don't you be happy when I'm sad. Do you know how many people in this room are thinking, what an ass. I wish he'd finish. Shut up. <laughs> That's right, my sponsor. But uh, No, I remember going to meetings and hearing windbags and thinking, aren't you terrific? Aren't you just having a wonderful life? <laughs> There's a bus leaving in 15 minutes. Be under it, you know? I don't want what you have. I didn't know what you had. Dwayne took me to this meeting. I'm 23. I'm slick. I've got hair at that time. I had, I was, I had big billboards on the side of buses with my picture on there and doing the drive show. I remember laying in front of the, the Queen's Hotel, the Skid Row Hotel in this town in which I was broadcasting, in my own vomit. And I came to, and just as I did, a bus went by with my picture on it. Well, maybe there's something wrong with me. Maybe not. We went to a meeting. He said, you're going to love this thing. It's in a restaurant. I said, in a restaurant? Wait a minute. In a restaurant? Aren't there, like there's, will people know we're going to this meeting? He said, I suppose. <laughs> Dwayne, you know. Oh, he said, you don't have to worry. They don't know what we're doing back there. All right. I'm going through the restaurant. This is, I'm saying to people that are eating, where I'm, not go, this, I'm not going to the Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. Uh, the, uh, nothing to do with that. I'm just going, the, 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 you know, people are looking at you like, what? <laughs> the difference between self-centered and what everybody else is, is that when you're self-centered, that's what your core is. Everything is about you. What's the opposite of that? God-centered. When you're God-centered, everything looks different. Trees turn green again. Believe me. Newcomers, this is true. You're going to drive down the street one day, and you're going to phone your sponsor, you're going to say, but you notice... How pretty the flowers are right now. <laughs> it happens. And, and, you know, you fall in love again. And, you know, life takes, you start to have a different, you start to live in the fourth dimension. That doesn't mean it's always going to be easy and everything like that. I mean, I went to this meeting and there were people there, old people, 40, 50, 55, old, wrinkly, kind of look like I do now, actually. <laughs> and they were going up and down a set of 12 stairs or some damn thing. I didn't know what the hell they were doing. There was one guy leading them, but he didn't say a lot. He was, he was pretty humble, I thought. And he was asking other ones to talk on stuff. And one of them said that he'd been stuck on the fifth stair for quite a while. <laughs> oh, and that sent an electric chill through the entire group. They said, you better get off that fifth stair. You'll get drunk. And I'm thinking, where is that fifth stair? <laughs> you know, when you're new and you come to this culture and we've got all our own little in-language and our little in-jokes and we sing happy birthday, you know how weird that is when you're a newcomer and there's like five grown men standing there? Happy birthday to you. It's like... <laughs> Good for you, Bob. Yeah. I can't wait for my cake. <coughs> you know. To us, it's meaningful. Because we know how damn hard it is to put together 30 days. I think 30 days for me was the toughest of all, to tell you the honest to God truth. It was like once I got that 30 days, I thought, you know, I'm so dry, I could catch fire. I, I like it. <laughs> I was afraid of the Norwegian. He told me outside of a meeting one night that if I drank, he was going to bust every bone in my body. And I said, why do you say stuff like that? And he said, because I love you. And he said, if you drink, 
you're going to get beat up, and I don't want strangers hurting you. I'll beat you up myself. So I, I just, you know. You see, what's hard in Alcoholics Anonymous is, is that if you're like I was when I got here, I had this actor that I'd presented the world for such a long time, and, and I had a little, you know, character I'd pull out, and you'd say, how are you? And I'd say, really good. <laughs> you asshole. I mean, I didn't say that out loud. That was my inside voice. But, and, and so when he said to me after the meeting, how did you like the meeting? I said, I loved it. You guys really got something going there, and if you need any help, like if I can do anything for you in broadcasting, collect money, whatever you need. He said, yeah, that's fine, that's fine. So anyway, what time do you want to go to a meeting tonight? And I said, I don't want to go to a meeting tonight. And he said, oh, yeah, you're going to a meeting tonight. I said, I don't have to. He said, oh, yeah, you do. <laughs> I said, what do you mean I do? And he said, do you know why we call ourselves Alcoholics Anonymous, Marty? And I said, no. And he said, because there's a whole bunch of us. And you don't know who we are. And I'm not saying everybody should be sponsored like this, but I don't know how I would have got here without this guy. I, I spoke at his 40th birthday, and I was going on and on and on. Dwayne, he gave up his time, his life. He spent time with me. When he, when he got up and talked, he said, Man, I didn't do that because of you. I was fighting with my wife, and I didn't want to go home. I didn't care about you. What the hell are you talking about? And he was serious. He was a pig. That's why I love him so much. We went to the night meeting. The night meeting was crazier than the breakfast meeting, except that there was girls at the night meeting. Hookers, I figured, because... Yeah. And if anybody here is a hooker, I'm not putting it down. I'm the only person I know that never gets propositioned by hookers. I mean, how ugly do you have to be that not even working girls will ask you for a date? I mean, that's awful. Anyway, I said, they, you know that thing they do? Would the newcomer like to say something? And you're supposed to say, I was so screwed up, and then I, now I found you. And <laughs> your message tonight changed me. I saw, I felt, I'm a new man. <laughs> and what comes out of my mouth is, were you guys hookers? <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And Ruth, the vocal of the two, said, uh, no, I was never a hooker, Marty, but what I used to do is get really loaded, and then I'd pick up an anemic-looking little turd like you and uh, <laughs> party with them sometimes, yeah? Well, Dwayne and the other alcoholics thought this was very funny. And uh, when we got outside, they mocked me. They got around in a circle, and they made fun of me, and then they all went home, feeling better about themselves. <laughs> Dr. Silkworth called it the start of deflation at great depth. I was at a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, that same meeting the following Sunday. I was trying to hear. I couldn't hear anything. Everybody sounded the same. They all did the same message. I was desperate. I'm not desperate. I have a million dollars. I have, I have now seven cars, and I just don't know if it can get any more wonderful. That's all I ever heard. But, and I knew they were lying because I lied. You know, if you can't trust, it's because you're not trustworthy. If you think everybody's a liar, guess what? That's in you. I'm at this meeting, and all of a sudden I feel something really weird under the table. I think, what the hell? And I look under the table, and it's a 30-year sober member named Joe Glum putting shoelaces in my shoes. <laughs> I said to him, you know, like when I was many years sober, Joe, why did you do that? And he said, I just... I." I could see how poor you were, and I felt so bad, and I, I, I just, I, you never had any laces in your shoes, and I, one night I just couldn't stand it. I had them, I was going to give them after the meeting, and then I thought, well, that'll embarrass him. So I said, do you think going under the table, <laughs> Joe? You don't have to do this to stay sober, but it helps. You know what I'm saying? I don't know what's going to happen to you if you're new in this room, but I'm telling you, don't hate the people that are hard on you. Don't hate the people that are dragging you around. Don't. I mean, they, we used to do stuff. They told me, if you don't have more fun sober than you did when you're drunk, you're going to be drunk again. So tonight's mandatory fun night. And I go, oh, whoopee, you know. 
Jesus, kill me. Somebody kill me, please. And we go over to Dwayne's house and he had a dog that was sold that had no teeth anymore. His name was Tinker. He's six foot five. He's got Tinker. And you'd knock on the door. And the dog would go, Woo. Woo. And then it'd have to go lay down. The drunks would be on the floor because of Tinker. I'm saying that's not funny. Oh, yeah, that's hysterical. Watch this. Okay. No, Tinker, smile. No. Drunk. I'm thinking, I, oh, God. Oh, God. One day at a time. This is forever. They know where I... Oh, Jesus. And they introduced... They, they brought a guy to help me. His name was... Oh, I wouldn't say his name, but he... He lived down the block from me and they said, he can really help you. And then he told me a story. He'd beaten his best friend to death with his bare hands and got out of the technicality. I thought, oh, Jesus. <laughs> oh, God. Now they've introduced... The murderers know where I live now. Thank you, sister. A Norwegian, ignoramus, big killer guy and a murderer. Yeah, I feel better. I, I want what you have. I'm thinking, what the hell do you have? Let me get this straight. I can, I can get wrinkly, not drink for the rest of my life, go up and down the stairs and, and play with Tinker. Is this, is this, bring it on. Is this it? That's why we have to admit in step one. We have to admit because, you see, everything that I was seeing was everything that would keep me apart and different then. I couldn't see the fun in anything because if I did, it'd have to stay. You see, people say, I don't get the steps. Of course you don't until you admit that you have no power over alcohol, until you admit that your life has become unmanageable, you can't accept. That's my program. Admit and accept. A-A, admit and accept. Today, sober, admit and accept. You made a mistake, accept it. It's not the end of the world. And so once I admitted and I accepted and I came to believe that there was a power, stranger than myself, some of the guys called God, which emitted all sorts of emotions because I remembered God. Now it was that God from Sunday school. That's where I went as a little kid, and then they kicked me out for selling condoms because they're narrow-minded. That's God. You see, you'd be much better to say something like being or presence or higher power or something that didn't have a whole bunch of luggage attached to it. They said, just what do you conceive God to be? And I said... Punishing, waiting, like some sort of like barbecue guy that's going to cook your ass as soon as you like, you're dead, eh? <laughs> yeah. You know, and then all the good ones watching. Oh, give it to him. Give it to him really good. That son of a bitch, he did things to me. My wife and the kids. Oh, slower, slower, slower. I um, admitted, I finally accepted that there was something outside of myself. And I turned what I was doing and what I was thinking over to the care of, are you ready? Dwayne. I'd love to tell you I got to God right away. I didn't. I know that Alcoholics Anonymous for me today is more about finding a conscious connection to my higher power than going to meetings, reading the big books, you know, all that stuff. That's all just mechanism stuff. I'm trying to improve my conscious contact with the creator of all things. That's what it all boils down to at the end of the day. When I have that, then what happens is my nature, your nature, all of our natures, is to be joyful and peaceful and free. That's how we are actually built. But it's obscured, as Bill says in his story, with pomp and circumstance and worldly stuff. And we obscure the joy. We only touch it every once in a while. And then when we get in connection... Step 11, sought through prayer and meditation to improve, make better that conscious contact with that higher power. That joy just pops up. Just what we are comes through. And you're sitting at a meeting one day, and you start to cry. And you don't know why you're so happy, you don't know what to do. And you, and you, and you just see newcomers, and you see families come together. and There's a tremendous amount of fun about it all. I spent a whole bunch of time with John and Lucy and Stan. Um unrepeatable, just fun. It's been nuts. And I want to thank the specific group for allowing me to come one more time, tell my ragged little story. 
I hope that there is one person in here that got anything from anything I said. If you did that, I had a big night. Those of you that found things that I said offensive, please take it home and use it. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>